On this edition of the Nesson College Hockey Podcast, we'll look at the week ahead, speak with UConn head coach Mike Cavanaugh, and give you our Hockey East All-Decade team. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Nesson College Hockey Podcast. I'm Dakota Randall, alongside always Pat McAvoy. Pat, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Listen, it's holiday season. Uh, we're, we're back after a week off. Yep, a yep. lot of teams were on holiday break last week. They're kind of still on it this week. Um, so we didn't have an episode last week. So we are back, hopefully yep. better than ever. Uh, we got a weird, kind of a different show for you today. It's holiday season. So again, a lot of teams were off over the weekend. Some returned this weekend, but there are a lot of exhibition games, holiday, holiday classic tournaments, non-conference games. So kind of weird. Um, well, not weird, but you know, just kind of all over the place with the schedule. Uh, so we'll get to all that. We also have an interview with UConn head coach Mike Cavanaugh that you did, Pat. So we're Absolutely. looking forward to that. Yep. Uh, as his team prepares for the Ledyard Classic. And we'll also give you our Hockey East team of the decade, our sort of player of the decade for each team, really. Uh, we'll get to all of that in a little bit. Before we go any further, I want to get into the Nesson schedule. Uh, it all starts Saturday with the Ledyard Classic in Hanover, New Hampshire. Uh, at Dartmouth with St. Lawrence, St. Lawrence, sorry, playing UConn at 4 p.m. on Nesson, uh, and later that night, Colorado College taking on Dartmouth at 7 p.m. on Nesson, and then fast forward to Monday, we have Vermont visiting number 12 Northeastern at 4 p.m. on Nesson. And remember that all of our hockey's coverage is brought to you by Rockland Trust, where each relationship matters. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll get to all that in a little bit. We'll get to the interview with UConn head coach Mike Cavanaugh. We'll get to our Hockey East team of the decade. Uh, but you know, there was only really one or a couple games uh, over the weekend to get that, that, that took place. Yep. So obviously not a lot to recap, uh, but I know, Pat, that you were watch, you were taking a, taking note of the Arizona State-Omaha series. Yep. Uh, Arizona really? State and Omaha, or Nebraska-Omaha splitting. Uh, so yeah, what were your takeaways from that game? I got to be honest, I didn't see it, but I know you did. So uh, what did you think? Because those are two good teams, two underrated teams. Absolutely. I thought it was, I thought it was an interesting series. So Arizona State came into the contest. They've been kind of up and they, – they were hot. Now they've become kind of up and down. They entered uh, this two-game set after splitting with Michigan State a couple weeks ago. And so they were kind of looking to get back on track. They were 16 in the country. They're a very good team, very solid team. I think they're underrated, like you mentioned, going into the season. They've kind of showed that they have what it takes to play with, like the top dogs in college hockey this year. But I think this matchup with Omaha, they kind of took a step back. Uh, first game, Saturday night, they won 5-4. It's a great game. Uh, they they went down big. They were down, not big. They went down. Then they had a big second period. They had four unanswered goals to take a 4-2 lead. But then uh, Omaha came back. They tied the game up. But then Brett Gruber scored with 13 minutes left for Arizona State to take the take the game. It was all uh, all hands on deck throughout the game for Arizona State. They, uh, all five of their goals were scored by different players. And all in all, it was a good hockey game. It was back and forth. You, and really, you couldn't tell who the better team was throughout. And luckily, Arizona State came away with the win. But then the kind of narrative shifted on Sunday. Um, similar to Saturday, they got out to a 4-2 lead. But unlike um, Saturday's contest, they weren't able to do close the door and finish it off. And then they gave up six unanswered goals, starting with two at the end of the second period, and then four more in the third period, including one empty netter. Um, it just really wasn't their best, I don't want to say effort, it wasn't their best performance of the season. Um, they're still number 16 in the polls, and we'll talk about that, I guess, um, coming up. But it really wasn't their best showing for a team as skilled as I believe they are. I kind of figured they were going to come in and either sweep the, sweep the series or maybe get a win and a tie. I didn't expect to lose a loss, especially not eight to four, but you know, uh, now they get to go home for Christmas, maybe get some, meet, see some family, have some good food, maybe get a couple presents if they were good, <laughs> and then maybe they can come back and uh, start the second half of the season strong when we come back. Yeah, uh, I, I kind of agree with everything you said. I thought it was uh, an interesting series. I didn't, I didn't get to watch, but just looking at the results and kind of yeah. looking at the stats, um, I do agree. Uh, that Arizona State kind of took a little bit of a step back, but again, they're where are they in the polls? Let me just double check real quick. 16th. So yep. I think they're still a. I still think they're a very good team. Absolutely. And uh, I think I still think they have a chance to make some noise come tournament time. Uh, but yeah, I would have liked to have seen them sweep Omaha. Uh, I think they're definitely good enough to. Mm -hmm. That said, Omaha has shown some punch this season, so I'm not surprised they true. they picked up a, a, a W. 
Uh, but yeah, good stuff. Good series. A lot more action that'll take place this weekend, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so yeah, I want to get into our Hockey East Team of the Decade. So uh, for anybody interested, Nesson.com this week in celebration of the turn of the decade into the 2020s. We are doing a lot of all decade, best of the decade content. Uh, we have you know, the Red Sox team of the decade, Celtics team of the decade, Patriots, Bruins, where we give you the best players at each position for those teams over the course of the past 10 years. We also pick our best team from each of those franchises over the past 10 years. So are the 2018 Red Sox the best Red Sox team over the last 10 years? This is the 13 team. What about the Bruins, Patriots, et cetera? And then we are also counting down our top 10 Team, or top 10 moments of the decade in Boston sports. We were already at number eight. I forget, number 10 was this Zidane O'Chara coming back from the broken jaw. I forget what number nine is, uh, but we're, count, we're revealing an, a different moment each of the next uh, eight days, started two days ago, so our top 10 moments. I got one coming out on Wednesday. Ooh. I won't tell you about that, but you can look forward to that. Uh, so we also are doing, uh, it's not just the four, uh, the four major teams in town. We also have Hockey East content, as we mentioned. Uh, we also have Liverpool, Connecticut Sun, so a ton of stuff celebrating what's really been an incredible, mm -hmm. uh, an incredible decade in New England sports. And you can find all that content by going to nesson.com slash decade. That's nesson.com slash decade. A lot of people in the team have put a lot of work into yep. it. We're pretty proud of it. I, uh, I think it's a lot of good stuff. Again, looking back on what's been really an incredible decade in New England sports, especially in the city of Boston. Uh, so yeah, look forward to all that, but for now we're going to focus on the Hockey East Team of the Decade. Yep. I did not compile this list. This was Nesson.com's Logan Mullen, who uh, hosts the Boston, co-hosts the Boston Bruins yep. podcast, the Nesson Bruins podcast. Good guy, local guy. Yep, with our, with our own Mike Cole. Uh, so Logan definitely knows his hockey, and he decided to take on this task. Um, you know, we, I did the Red Sox, other Absolutely. people did other stuff, so Logan did Hockey East. And so uh, the view, I'm just going to go through who he chose. Yep. Uh, I agree with most of his list. I, I may, may have differed in a couple of spots. Um, but overall, I think he was pretty spot on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll just go through this real quick. I won't spend a ton of time on it. But I thought it was interesting to see. I uh, just kind of look back for all of these programs over the past 10 years. So for Boston College, Logan chose Johnny Gaudreau, kind of an obvious choice. Uh, he won, uh, won the Hobie Baker in 2014 after posting 80 points in 40 games. Just ridiculous. Uh, that was an appropriate cap to what was a prolific three-year run for Gaudreau and Chestnut Hill. And now he is starring on the Calgary Flames, one of True. the best young players in the NHL. Uh, so yeah, Johnny Gaudreau, player of the decade for Boston College. Just down Comab a little bit for uh, Boston University. We have Jack Eichel, who only played one season at BU, uh, but he was excellent, slashing 26, 45, and 71. Uh, winning the Hobie Baker, I believe he was the number two player in the draft that season, uh, taken in the NHL draft. Uh, he was excellent at BU, and he has continued that in the NHL ranks where he is starring for the Buffalo Sabres when he's healthy. He is awesome. Uh, UConn, we'll talk about UConn a little bit later, uh, but for here, uh, the Huskies only have been in hockey for a few years, so obviously not a huge sample size. Mm -hmm. Logan mm -hmm. chose Tage Thompson forward. Uh, he was consistent on the wing during his two years in stores. He posted 32 points in both seasons, just shy of making him a point-per-game player for his career. So one of the more consistent players for the Huskies since they've entered Hockey East, and I think a worthy choice for the UConn player of the decade. Uh, over to Maine, Ben Hutton, defenseman. Uh, he played for the Black Bears from 2012 to 2015. I certainly remember watching a lot of him uh, when I would watch Maine and UNH in the early part of the decade. Uh, now an NHL mainstay. Uh, he spent three seasons again in Orono, where he was an uh, All-American in his sophomore year. He finished his time with the Black Bears having played 108 games and he racked up, uh, or he slashed 28, 37, and 65 over those three, th uh, three seasons. So really one of the more productive defensemen in all mm -hmm. the nation. Uh, one of the best defensemen to come through Maine in a long time. And uh, just an all around great player, and you're seeing it in the NHL. Uh, speaking of great defensemen from Hockey East making a living in the NHL, UMass, Logan Schultz, Kill McCarr, rightfully so. Uh, he was excellent for UMass last season, leading them to the national championship game where they eventually lost. Uh, but he won the Hobie Baker. Uh, for the nation's top player. Um, so he's, even though he just spent just two seasons at Amherst, uh, he was probably the best player that's come through there over the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And now he is just excelling with a Colorado Avalanche. Might be on his way to winning Rookie of the Year. He's just been exceptional. Uh, UMass Lowell goalie, Connor Hellebuck, who Bruins fans probably know from watching the Bruins take on the Winnipeg Jets. He is the goalie for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, and he was also the goalie for the UMass Lowell Riverhawks from 2012 to 2014. Uh, obviously, he was excellent. Um, 
He amassed a 952 save percentage with a 1.37 goals against average in his freshman year, followed by a 941 save percentage and 1.79 goals against average in his sophomore season. Uh, so he was excellent. And then he went pro and he continu continued that, and he has been a very good goalie, I would say, for the Winnipeg Jets over the past half decade. Onward to your alma mater, Patrick Absolutely. Merrimack. Absolutely. Forward Mike Collins. Mm -hmm. He hasn't quite made it. Uh, you know, he never quite found his footing in the pro game uh, in America. But while he was at Merrimack, Collins was a very good player uh, at the beginning of the decade. Was there from 2010 to 2014. He posted a career high 17 goals and 21 assists in 38 games during his All American junior season, where Merrimack was one of the best teams in hockey East. True. Uh, so yeah, Mike Collins, worthy choice for Merrimack's Player of the Decade. Uh, just a couple more. UNH, Logan Choles chose Tyler Kelleher, Ford, who was there from 2013 to 2017. Kelleher was good. Uh, Might have gone Paul Thompson. There were a couple directions he could have gone. Uh, but Kelleher was great um, from Long Meadow, Mass, so a local guy. Uh, he had some big numbers during his four seasons with the Wildcats. Uh, including 24, 39, and 63 senior season. 24 goals, 39 assists. That's a lot of production. Uh, during his senior year in 2016, 2017, uh, you know, kind of put an exclamation point on what was very underrated uh, career for Tyler Kelleher because UNH, you know, didn't make a lot of noise those four seasons. You know, they didn't really make any, no you know, make international tournament or make any headway there. Um, you know, not, not some of the best seasons for the Wildcats program, but Tyler Kelleher uh, did have some great seasons there. And uh, I think he's, he's a good choice. Again, maybe Paul Thompson, but I think he finished in 2010, so that's kind of a hard one. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, Northeastern, <coughs> Adam Gaudet, kind of a no-brainer for me. Uh, he was there from 2015, 2018. Uh, he arrived at Northeastern after having just been selected in the fifth round of the 2015 NHL draft. And he did nothing but just skyrocket his value while he was at Northeastern. He had at least 25 goals and 25 assists in two of his three seasons, including a 30 30 season uh, during 2017-18 before hitting the pros. Uh, yeah, Adam, Adam Gaudet, one of the best players to ever go through Northeastern. Uh, Providence, uh, John Gillies, goalie. Uh, three, for three years, uh, Gillies gave the Friars a reliable goalie between the pipes. Uh, for my money, he's probably the best goalie that I've seen there over the past decade, so I think it's the right choice by Logan. Uh, he had a save percentage below 930, uh, or goals against average above 216. Or, or sorry, he never had a save percentage below 930 uh, or goals against average above 216. So he was just consistent, great for the Friars. And, uh, you know, he hasn't quite made it in the NHL, but he's young. He's only 25, so there's still hope. Um, and one more, Vermont. Uh, Mike Pagliota, defenseman. Uh, he was with the Catamounts from 2011 to 2015, Southern Connecticut native, so another New England guy. Um, he... Uh, Found more of a scoring touch as his college career went on. He didn't really begin it with a ton of flair uh, as a defenseman, but he sort of found that offensive defensive mindset as his career went on. Uh, he scored 27, scoring 27 and 36 points respectively in his junior and senior years. Uh, and he was an All-American in 2014-15, uh, his senior season. Uh, so yeah, Mike Pagliota, great job for the Catamounts and a uh, worthy selection by Logan. I think Logan did a good job with this list. Uh, no easy task, mm -hmm. considering how many players have gone through all these programs over Absolutely. the past 10 years. Uh, but yeah, good job, Logan. And again, if you want to see more of Nesson.com's all-decade content, you can go to Nesson.com slash decade. Check it all out. There's a ton of stuff for you to consume and read while you're laying on the couch after Christmas in a food coma True. or just dizzied from opening presents. Uh, so, you know, have fun. Check it out. And let us know what you think. Um, so before we get to our interview with Mike Cavanaugh, uh, we'd like to do what we always do, which is go over the polls. Mm -hmm. So there have been a few games over the past couple weeks. It hasn't been totally dry. Uh, and since the last time we spoke, we have a new number one. Yes, we do. North Dakota, mm -hmm. uh, since Minnesota State has kind of fallen back a little bit. So North Dakota at number one, Minnesota State number two, Cornell at number three, then Clarkson, Boston College, Denver, Ohio State, Penn State, UMass, Minnesota Duluth, Bowling Green, Northeastern Providence, UMass Lowell, Notre Dame, Arizona State, Harvard, Michigan State, Western Michigan, and Sacred Heart debuting at number 20. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, a lot of reshuffling. Any, any takeaways for you, Pat? Not many from this one because of the lack of games maybe, uh, or just because- Yeah, not a lot of shuffling or anything. 
it's very very much similar to last week from 12 through 20 is all the same um and then just at the top like you mentioned north dakota is at number one so good for them we've talked about them a lot in the poll uh on the You've podcast really high on them yeah and they're they're they've been on fire lately and rightfully so they've earned this number one spot um aside from that there haven't been really many big fallers denver rose uh probably the highest riser of the week they're up from eight to six so good on them penn state kind of been iffy lately they've fallen from seven to eight right um aside from that really not much of a difference bowling green dropped from 10 to 11 minnesota duluth rose from 11 to 10 now they have uh after christmas a big two game set against merrimack so we'll see if they can keep it rolling i guess or get back in the uh right direction um, yeah those games could be interesting they could be interesting um not glad or they could be blowouts i'm a little nervous I, I would be if i were you too i'm a little nervous for merrimack versus the two-time defending champs but aside from that um not a big change but i believe that right when we come out of christmas right around new year's our next episode i believe there's gonna be a lot of change going along Agreed. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing kind of what goes on in the next mm. couple of weeks because uh, we're going to get into the thick of this season. Uh, the postseason's coming up faster Seriously. than anybody uh, would probably like to believe. Or actually, well, you, you, you'd like the postseason because that means the warmer months are coming. But regardless, it's time Fair. is flying by. Fair. Absolutely. Uh, we're so roughly halfway in now. I know. So yeah. for hard to believe. Time, again, just goes by way too fast. For all the conversations you and I have had specifically about these polls, one thing that we've been able to uh, fall back on is that up until now, it's been, you know, everything's pretty early. Everything's going to work itself out. Yeah, now but, there are actually trends and patterns. But so. now we're going to get into it. Yeah. And uh, right when we get back after New Year's, I don't, I, I believe we have, I don't know which day our next show comes out, but after New Year's, I believe everything's very serious then. Right. No. Yeah, yeah, it's going to, yeah, everything. I mean, there are, all the games are serious for these programs, but things True. get real going forward here as teams look, you know, want to make sure that they make, their conference tournaments. I mm -hmm. uh, want to solidify their positioning when the tournament comes around. So yeah, looking forward to all that. Uh, now I want to get to our interview with UConn head coach Mike Cavanaugh. Yep. Uh, Huskies have won four in a row against Miami and Vermont. So not the best competition, but still, uh, they now are seven, six, and three, and in seventh place in the Hockey East. We've talked about them as a, an underrated team all season long. Yep. Um, they play St. Lawrence on Saturday at the Ledyard Classic, which you can watch on Nesson, and then mm -hmm. they play Dartmouth the next night. Uh, so a big weekend for UConn, and you spoke with Coach Kavanaugh before yep. we get into the interview. Any any takeaways? Any anything you wanted to say? It was interesting hearing her sp his perspective on the team because on the outside looking in, just looking at the roster or looking at stats and stuff like that, you can't get to know the players or understand what they think. And so, similar to uh, Merrimack, they're a young squad. They have seven freshmen, and I believe the number was 11 sophomores. Right. And so you have a really a lot young of team and a lot of Russians. Big we spoke favorite. about that a little bit. We yeah. spoke about the diversity amongst the team. And so having such a, young, such a young and diverse group, it was interesting to hear how he's able to get them all on the same page. And especially right now, they're playing some of their best hockey four in a row. Um, I think there's some big things coming in. We kind of spoke about that a little bit throughout the interview. So stick around and hear uh, what is going to happen next. Cool. Cool. Uh, well, yeah, let's get right to it. Uh, without mm -hmm. any further ado, here is UConn head coach Mike Cavanaugh. All right, so I'm here with UConn men's hockey head coach Mike Cavanaugh. How are you doing today, coach? I'm great, Patrick. Thanks for having me on today. It's my pleasure. So uh, let's let's get after it. So right now, sure. sitting at seven, six, and three. Coming off four straight wins over Vermont and Miami, how would you describe your team's play at the moment? You know, I think uh, clearly like the last month, I think we've played pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, you know, we had a tough weekend against Boston College in early November. Mm -hmm. And since that weekend in those eight games where you're five, one, and two, and had some really big uh series not only the the sweeps against Miami and Vermont but I thought we played very well against Lowell being able to take three out of four points there and yep uh, we had a great series with Providence we, we had a lot of guys injured and in, in that weekend and we still were able to manage to get a point so even mm -hmm. though uh, you know we only get one point out of that weekend I was very happy with the way we played so we were consistently playing the right way and mm -hmm. that's what also happened you know against Miami and Vermont so 
for the past month, I think we've been playing pretty solid hockey. So then to kind of go off what you were just talking about there, specifically with the Boston College weekend. So like you mentioned, the team's been on a roll since then. So what do you think changed that weekend that kind of uh, changed the trajectory of the team? You know, I just think, um, you know, I think that we focused, you know, more on playing the right way. I think we focused mm-hmm. more on winning winning our one-on-one battles and trying not to get so uh, par- paralyzed with systematic play and mm-hmm. really focus on winning our one-on-one battles. And we even took it to, you know, sometimes it's going to be one-on-two and you still got to win that battle. So mm-hmm. that was more of our mindset and just kind of carried over. That coupled with, you know, our special teams has gotten a lot better. Um you know, since that weekend, I think we're six to seven in goals scored in the country. So a lot of things, uh, when you're winning those one-on-one battles, you're, you're um, drawing more penalties, which gives you mm-hmm. more power play opportunities. Uh, you're getting on the inside and being able to get rebound goals. So it's really, I don't know if it's just one thing. I don't know if it's power play, penalty kill, um, you know, offensive zone play, breaking out of our zone, scoring off the rush. There's a lot of different ways you can create offense. I yep. think it really boils down to us being able to win that one-on-one battle. That sounds good. Sweet. Um, so now to kind of focus on this upcoming week. So you've had a little bit of time off, but now right after Christmas, you're in the Ledyard Classic against St. Lawrence and Dartmouth. So what do you think right. the team's biggest strength is entering this we get this slate of games well one um you know we hope to be healthy you know Mm -hmm. as long as uh everybody's healthy coming back off the break uh it'll be nice to have a full lineup Mm -hmm. i think that we understand that if we don't compete and uh, and it wasn't just boston college that beat us up merrimack beat us up too uh, Mm -hmm. at home And, and again it was you know, they they were hungrier and they were winning the battles more than we were. So uh, I think we've realized that if we want to be a successful hockey team, that's something that we have to do. We have to work together and it's got to be shift after shift. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when you play a high, we want to be a team that pressures the puck and uh, fights for every inch of the ice, all over the ice. If you want to do that in all three zones, you got to be one well conditioned, but you also mm-hmm. have to take short shifts. And that was another thing that we emphasized was our shift time. And we have to continue to do those things. If we go back to trying to beat teams with just skill mm-hmm. uh, and not focus on the will part of it, we'll we'll struggle again. Absolutely. And so you just kind of touched upon you touched upon it a little bit so far. You've mentioned the team's injuries, so I wanted to bring up one specifically. Um, so the squad, you missed out on Johnny Evans for three weeks after he broke a finger, but he came back against Vermont, and he had a hat trick in uh, the Saturday game, I believe. How would you describe what he brings to the team now that he seemingly is healthy? Yeah, well, it certainly gives us more depth in our lineup. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, with, with him in the lineup, and we had a couple guys out. You know, Kale Howarth was out for yep. a while. So, But to get all those guys back, uh, mm-hmm. It gives us a lot more depth in our lineup. It was, we were able to roll four lines. We were able to, as I said, you know, not shorten the bench and uh, have to take, you know, guys get a lot more ice time, and you can't play as hard. If, you, if you're playing 18 minutes a night as opposed to 15 minutes a night, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, your shifts aren't going to be as intense. So, uh, mm-hmm being able to lengthen our lineup, and then he just brings a skill element. Uh, that's He's a very highly skilled player and excellent uh, offensive contributor to our team. Absolutely. Um, so now to kind of switch gears a little bit away from the injuries but to the roster itself. So I was looking at the team today, and I noticed you have a young squad with uh, seven freshmen and I believe 11 sophomores. So I wanted to ask you, uh, how is it coaching such a young squad, getting everybody on the same page with the upperclassmen? Well, you know, last year it was really hard because we had, you know, I think 12 freshmen. Mm -hmm. Um, But now all those guys have become sophomores, and that's a big difference. 
mm-hmm. you know, and right now up front, you know, uh, we have what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven of our forwards that are playing consistently, or at least six, are sophomores. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so they. I don't really. I know they're young still. But they, yep. they've had a lot of experience, and they know what it's like to have to go to BC or Providence or up to Maine. So they have mm-hmm. a pretty good feel for what the league, uh, you know, is going to throw at them. So I feel like last year was a real issue on our team. Uh, this year it hasn't been as much because we've had those guys get a year of experience under their belt, but also we've had incredible senior leadership. You know, Wyatt New Power. Sasha uh, Piasov and Justin Howell and Ben Freeman, they've mm-hmm. done a you know remar- remarkable job uh, night in and night out leading this team and showing the team how we want to play. Sounds pretty sweet. And honestly, it kind of goes into my next question a little bit. So now, so another thing about the team, so I noticed that it's, you have a very diverse group. You have people from Russia, Czech Republic, Canada, spread out all throughout the United States. And so this is probably this is probably very similar to my previous question, but how do you go about coaching such a diverse group and getting everybody on the same page as well? Yeah, you know, hockey players are hockey players, and if you look, I, I a lot of people that's the first thing they'll ask is how diverse our roster is. But mm. I think the sports become so global. If you go around the league and, and mm-hmm. look at different teams, you know, BC has uh, three Finnish kids on their team. Lowell has mm-hmm. three or four foreign kids on their team. Maine, I think, has seven foreign kids on their team. Mm-hmm. Uh, just look in, look in the NHL, how many different nationalities uh, NHL teams are represented Absolutely. by. I just think it's, uh, you know, there's one language, there's a, there's a language of hockey that they all understand. And mm-hmm. sports, um, you may play on a bigger sheet or you may play, you know, on a smaller sheet. And there's different styles, but at the end of the day, you know, it really comes down to, as I alluded earlier, the team that wins the most puck battles is the team that's usually successful at the end of the night. Absolutely. And so I don't have many questions for you left, but so I want to continue talking about the roster right now. So we've talked about it already. Sure. Uh, young guys, upperclassmen, diverse group. But so all in all, you have a wide mix of young guys and upperclassmen. So with this team seemingly coming together right now, four wins in a row, entering a, a solid match that we got coming up this sub, a couple of weeks, uh, what are your goals for the rest of the season and beyond? You know, I, I think you can – you know, I always talk to the team about having a telescope and a microscope. And, you know, the telescope of, sure, hey, we want to win the lead yard. You know, we want to win, uh, you know, Hockey East. You know, that, that's yep. the big thing. We want to get to a national tournament. But, mm-hmm. you know, uh, right now in the microscope is the Ledyard Classic. And uh, we want to be able to win that tournament. And the only mm-hmm. way we do that is uh, playing very well Saturday night against St. Lawrence. And, uh, you know, their team, I watched them play against Clarkson, a, a rival game where they played extremely well. Uh, I know Brent frecky has been in this college hockey for a long time. He's an excellent coach. Uh, you know, they uh, took points from Maine. So mm-hmm. I think they're going to be a very uh, hard-nosed opponent from what I've watched of them on tape. And we're going to have to play extremely well if we want a chance to win that tournament. So that's our goal, ultimate, you know, goal right here in the short future is mm-hmm. to win the win the Ledyard Classic. Absolutely. Uh, so I just want to say again, I want to reiterate, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast today. We really appreciate it. Uh, good luck the rest of the way. We're pulling for you, and happy holidays. Thank you very much, Coach. Pat, thanks Thanks for having me on. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to everybody out there. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right. You too, Pat. Bye. <laughs> And welcome back. I want to thank again UConn head coach Mike Cavanaugh. Great interview, Pat. Thank you. Uh, you know, I really, it was interesting hearing his comments. Seems like a really nice guy. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to see what UConn does here as mm. the season goes on. They're a sneaky candidate once the hockey's tournament comes around. They can make some noise. And I think Coach Cavanaugh has confidence in his team, as he should. Um, so yeah, 
Thanks again, Coach Cavanaugh, for speaking with our Patrick McAvoy. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so there's not much time left. I want to give you the Nesson schedule again. It all starts Saturday at the Ledyard Classic when St. Lawrence takes on UConn at 4 p.m. on Nesson. Uh, and then a couple hours later, Colorado College playing Dartmouth at 7 p.m. on Nesson. A couple of days later, on Monday, Vermont visiting number 12 Northeastern at 4 p.m. on Nesson. And remember, all of our hockey's coverage is brought to you by Rockland Trust, where each relationship matters. Uh, so again, I, I talked about it in the open, kind of a weird schedule this weekend, some exhibitions, some mm -hmm. classics or holiday tournaments, not every team is playing. Uh, so I'm just going to touch on you know, a couple of the games uh, that I have a little bit of an interest in. Arizona State at Harvard, you talked about Arizona State earlier, yep. Arizona State number 16, Harvard number 17, as they've kind of struggled a little bit here, uh, but still two very good teams, and I just want to see, I think that's going to be a good hockey game. Uh, Arizona State doesn't come out this way often. Uh, so I'm excited to see what they got. Absolutely. And uh, if I can, I might make it to that game. I like, you know, trying to check out some of the non-hockey teams mm -hmm. when I get an opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, so that could be a great game. The Minnesota Duluth, two games at Merrimack. I mean, you, you probably should pick Minnesota Duluth to win by a million in both yeah, games. Probably. But they've had some, some suspicious uh, or some odd results so far this season for the two-time defending champs. Mm. Um, still a great team, but Merrimack has had a couple of, uh, I forget, they tied... Oh, they tied BU or tied UMass. Like it's, it's been a while now, but regardless, uh, they've, they've played some good teams strong, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if Merrimack sneaks out a tie in one of these games. Seriously. Maybe a huge upset. Merrimack's uh, scrappy. They are scrappy. They play a lot better than their record. Um, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting two-game series. It could it could really get out, get out of hand, but it, you know I think uh, the Warriors could show some fight. And also, I alluded to some of those classics or holiday tournaments. Uh, so, yeah, there are a few around the country. we got the Catamount Cup. Catamount Cup up in Burlington, Vermont. A Union, Providence, Lake Superior, obviously UVM's in that. The Mariucci Classic in Minnesota, where you get St. Cloud State, Minnesota, Bemidji, Minnesota State, I believe is in that tournament as well. Um, so, I mean, if you can find a way to watch those games, uh, do so because that's a lot of that's a lot of great hockey mm -hmm. uh, in one place. And then, of course, the aforementioned Lead Yard Classic that you can watch two of the games right here on Nesson uh, that we're looking forward to. So, yeah, kind of an offbeat schedule this weekend with all the teams sort of either on holiday break or coming back. But still a lot of great action around college hockey uh, that I'm looking forward to. Me too. Um, yeah, that's all I got. That's all I got too. I think we have a good couple of weeks coming. Yeah, and uh, got any big plans over Christmas, Pat? Or Nothing. whatever you, I don't know what you celebrate for the Nothing holidays. Nothing crazy. Um, family's coming over. i um, going to watch the Celtics. Hopefully take down the Raptors. Okay. Um, aside from that, really nothing crazy. What about you? Yeah, every year I do a, uh, a huge family reunion up in New Hampshire. That's uh, cool. We're like, oh, we got like 30 something deep at my wow. uncle's house. We do it every year. Everybody gets everybody presents, so it's, it's incredibly stressful trying to shop for everybody, <laughs> especially when you're poor. Uh, but... Uh, I look forward to that every year, uh, and I'm really excited for it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's the best, best time of the year, one of the best times of the year. So, um, yeah, Christmas. Hope all of our listeners have a happy holidays. Absolutely. Merry Christmas. And uh, we will catch you next week with another edition of the Nesson College Hockey Podcast. Thanks Absolutely. for listening, everybody. Thank you for listening. All right, catch you next week.